Welcome back to Seeker Strength. Welcome back to Seeker Stan. Today, we're talking about rugby strength and conditioning for players in their 30s. We're incredibly lucky to have some great data on adult rugby players here in Ireland. Multiple large-scale studies over the last 20 years or so gathering information on participation, injury occurrence, even socioeconomic backgrounds and geographical splits. But what's really interesting for us today is age dynamics. A study done from 2007 to 2011 found close to 75% of players stopped playing between the ages of 17 and 21. This data is pretty similar to a study ran between 2013 and 17, but the later study did find players hanging on for maybe an extra year or two after school. This could, of course, be due to the growing popularity of under-20s and college rugby, but it could also be due to the fact that teenagers are lifting more weights now and are finding it easier to make the transition into the adult game. On the opposite end of the scale, however, we're seeing most players over 80% have retired from the game by the age of 30 or 31 years old. So what's going on here? Senior players are absolutely vital to every rugby team, as you know all too well if you've spent some time playing. And rugby has a sharper decline in playing numbers than most other sports. Certainly it has the lowest population of players over 30 in Ireland. What we're going to talk about now is whether we could have a similar correlation for players over the age of 30 than what we see in players over the age of 17, and maybe S&C training and more effective physical preparation could continue holding on to players later in their career. There are two massive keys to staying effective in your 30s. The first is staying as strong as humanly possible, and the second is evading injury both of which are made much more difficult, but by no means impossible with age. So, staying strong, what do we mean here? Well, holding on to muscle mass, being able to generate as much power as possible, having the speed still in your legs, and being able to maintain ranges of motion around your hips, ankles, shoulders, and back are the primary objectives. Right, so let's look at maintaining muscle mass firstly. Rugby, at least around these parts, is a long, hard slog of a season. Many teams joining back for pre-season around the end of July or start of August and playing games all the way through to April of the next year. This leaves very little time for an off-season. When we're in-season playing two or three games per month, it's incredibly difficult to gain muscle mass and for this reason, we see senior players often falling out of favour with their hypertrophy or strength training work in the gym. Now I know why this happens. Players are beginning to feel like they're slowing down and their cardio is getting worse, and so prioritise the conditioning element of their game. The recovery times are also increasing, and so the day or two after a game, you can really still feel the effects of the hits and the general work you did at the weekend. And now suddenly it's Tuesday or Wednesday and you've another pitch session to do and so you can't get your gym work in. There are also the obvious lifestyle changes that senior players have to deal with. Jobs, families and responsibilities all make it more difficult to get in for an extra gym session or two each week. It's not like the glory days of being able to get to the gym four days a week while you're in college. But this slow decay of muscle mass is not an unabating tide. You can still maintain and build good quality muscle mass on a restricted schedule. And here's an example. Let's say you played predominantly Saturday games and training Tuesday and Thursday evenings. The first thing is, on Monday, whether it's morning or evening or whenever, you get a big squat session or a hex bar deadlift session done. This is what the session should look like. And for the sake of making it easier, let's just pick squats for today. Minute zero until minute 10 Exercise bike or rower is your best friend. Get your heart rate up and start sweating. This will do more to help your positions than any amount of stretching or foam rolling. Minute 11 until 30, get the bar out and get the main strength training done. Starting with an empty bar, do two sets of five long paw squats, sitting in the bottom position for three to five seconds on each rep while maintaining a strong brace. Then do one set of five, not paused, with the empty bar. This should take no longer than five or six minutes and then build up to your working weight for the day. Let's say it's 140 kilos for three sets of five. So a set of five at 60, 80 and 100 kilos. Then a triple at 120 kilos 
And now you're ready to start your working sets. You should have no more than two minutes rest in between your working sets. And I guarantee you these rep ranges up at around 75 to 80% of one rep max will be sufficient to gain both strength and muscle tissue. Once this is done, strip the bar and drop it to the floor. You're going to do two supersets. The first of the session is going to be barbell RDLs and EVO wheels. And the second one will be bench press and single arm cheetah rows. Then later in the week, do a lighter session with a bit more volume in it. This time, make sure to add in some Nordic hamstring curls, some direct back and neck work while you're nice and fresh, and any of the prehab or rehab exercises you need to do. Suddenly, by taking an hour during lunch or before work, you have quality training done and you're well on track to building good muscle and strength and range of motion around your joints, all without having to add any massive amount of time or take away from anything else that's going on within the week. Right, so the second aspect of this then is injury prevention. We're going to talk about two specific areas of injury today. The first is tendon and connective tissue injuries, and the second is concussion. Let's start with the tendon health. As we get older, we lose some elasticity in our connective tissues. The number one thing we need to do to prevent this from happening is to actually stimulate and use those tendons and connective tissues. Tendons act as a temporary storage vessel for power. Like an elastic band on a catapult, storing energy as you pull it back, then releasing it in a split second once you leave go. When you land on the ground, your calf muscle contracts once you perceive the ground contacting your foot. Then the tendon that attaches your calf to the sole of your foot stretches, stiffening your ankle, and then springs back to push your foot down. If the tendon isn't strong enough, or pliable enough, or the muscle or impact exerts too much force, then a tear will occur. So how do we stimulate it? Well, it's a spectrum. Initially, the tendon can be activated by just simple isometrics, so a calf raise hold with some weight, but this, of course, can only get you so far. So, if you're a fairly well-developed athlete, used to sprinting and exerting a lot of force out on the field, then you'll need to be doing some amount of plyometrics. The sprinting, jumping and landing you're doing in a standard match or pit session may be enough, but it could also be completely inadequate and so, if you're getting repeated hamstring tears, and I put averted commas around those hamstring tears, or maybe your Achilles are really struggling to keep up later in a game or the days following a game, then you should look to add some plyos before your pitch training sessions. These pieces should take 15 minutes or less and should always be done at the very start of a training session when you're at your most fresh. Up next is concussion. Concussion is a dirty, dark side of our sport. It forced me to give up years ago and unfortunately caused me issues for many years after I stopped playing. Unfortunately, as SNC coaches, many of the issues around head injuries, such as tackle and rocking laws, substitution allowances and the return to play protocols are out of our hands. But what is in our hand is direct neck strength training. Multiple studies across multiple sporting domains, including rugby, have demonstrated the effectiveness of neck hypertrophy and strength training. The exact dynamics of the neck's influence on concussion are still being studied, but here are some of the reasons a stronger and thicker neck helps to limit concussions. Firstly, improved head stability, then increases in the amount of force the neck can absorb, also increased proprioception of the head, and aiding to limit the extreme ranges of motion a head might go through in contact. Every healthy rugby player should be doing neck training. Twice per week, at home, in the gym, in the change room, it really doesn't matter, but you should be taking this very small amount of time to help out your brain for the future. Continuing to physically improve as you get later on in your career is not impossible. To be honest, with the right help and know-how, it's not difficult at all. Many of the challenges faced are simply scheduling and organisational issues. We've got hundreds of rugby players on programmes right now, and even the players who are in season are making really good and consistent progress. You'll have seen videos of us talking about planning in-season and off-season training before, and you may have even seen us breaking down full training blocks, but... Just for today, I'd really like you to think about the planning of your actual week rather than the entire cycle. 
It can definitely be difficult. And if you're playing ball, you're already taking time away from your family, friends, work. But I don't think that solid S&C work is going to take up a massive portion of your week. I hope you can start to take a look at these in shorter and more effective training sessions and very specifically select your exercises to make sure the vital aspects of your training and gameplay are being maintained and continue to improve. Hopefully, this will allow you to maintain your effectiveness on the field and improve your ability to stop losing so much time due to injury. If you'd like to see some of the training programs we talked about today, please check out the Seeker Strength app available on iOS or Android. You can look at it during a free trial, run up to two programs at a time, and there's a full movement library to bring you through all of the exercises that are listed in the programs. Thanks for watching.